that is the foundation of our faith and our belief there have been a lot of prophets hallelujah but not all of them got up uh -huh. it's only one uh -huh. <laughs> that got back up again hallelujah. his name is Jesus and that's something to be glad about that God sent his only begotten son that we might have the right to the tree of life amen were you there and they crucified my Lord Amen. On this first Sunday of September, and as we are rounding out our last month and our last or last quarter, uh, the last month of the last quarter of dealing with the ill of the bold that love lives at the root. And as tomorrow is Labor Day and it is a day off, which um, if you're like me, I need a day off to sleep in. Hopefully, you can put some on the barbecue on the barbecue and have some time with family and friends. So I thought it a moment to do a, a Labor Day sermon. I've never done kind of a sermon on labor, um, but still rooted in love. So journey with me to the epistle of James, or the letter of James, there on the backside of the New Testament, the letter that James wrote to the diaspora, or diaspora. Has some folks were saying but the letter of James chapter 5 verses 1 through 12 now I'll be reading from the message translation if you could stand for the reading God's word is a little lengthy I'll try to read it at a good pace uh, but James chapter 5 verses 1 through 12 now I'll be reading from the message translation hear the words of James and a final word to you arrogant rich take some lessons in lament you'll need buckets for the tears when the crash comes upon you your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut destroying your life from within you thought you were piling up wealth what you've piled up is judgment all the workers, all the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused are a roar in the ears of the master avenger. You've looted the earth and lived it up, but all you'll have to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. In fact, what you have done is condemn and murder perfectly good persons who stand there and take it. Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You see, farmers do this all the time, waiting for their valuable crops to mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Be patient like that. Stay steady and strong. The master could arrive at any time. So friends, don't complain about each other. A far greater complaint could be lodged against you, you know. The judge is standing just around the corner. Verse 10, take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit, all the time honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and, and you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. That is because God cares, cares right down to the last detail. And verse 12, and since you know that God cares, let your language show it. Don't add words like, I swear to God, to your own words. Don't show your impatience by concocting oaths to hurry up God. Just say yes or no. Just say what is true that way. Your language cannot be used against you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and most of all, carrying out of God's holy word. I want to speak from the topic, my labor will not be in vain. My labor will not be in vain. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. 
And I just want to offer again greetings to all of the new uh, new visitors, to, uh, those who are worshiping with us for the first time, and those who are in, in the words of my friend, Reverend Charlotte Williams, over at uh, Allen Temple, her word is in the digisphere. Those who are work, uh, watching through uh, Facebook and live stream, uh, we welcome you into this space and for this preached word. My labor will not be in vain. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So, of course, well, may not everyone knows, but I went to Morehouse College. Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the, the alma mater of Dr. Martin Luther King, of Samuel Jackson, of Spike Lee, and of your own interim pastor, Jeremy McCants. <laughs> um, but I was uh, encouraged and uh, grateful and graced to join the Morals Glee Club uh, when I was there. I sung in the Morals Glee Club and it, it wasn't like the show Glee, if that's what most folks think of. It's not like Glee, um, but it was a male chorus. You had tenors, baritones, and bass. I was a baritone. And I, I would actually serve um, as president of the Morals Glee Club in my junior year, uh, which was something I was very, very proud of. Um, but there was a student club. It was ran uh, by the students and our director, Dr. David Morrow, made sure to let us know uh, that he was just the overseer, that he wasn't the one making the decision, but it was really about what we as the students wanted. And he was really using that space to cultivate us as leaders and uh, to us to become not just men of Morehouse, but to become Morehouse men. But at the end of every rehearsal, we rehearse uh, four days a week, um, for an hour and a half, almost two hours. And at the end of every rehearsal, we would have our motto or our kind of staple statement. And we would say after the end of every rehearsal, the Morehouse College Glee Club is an imminent expression of brotherhood, a united force of dedication and commitment, and an unselfish labor of love. An unselfish labor of love. That love is not just sacrifice or sacrificing which normally when we say sacrifice it normally gets a bad rap and you know I'm one that advocates that language and words do matter but sometimes we have to put new wine into old wineskins as they say that yes love is sacrifice but perhaps it's more than that that it is unselfish labor it is an unselfish labor of love that no matter how we serve and where we serve, that our labor and our work, what we do with our hands, our feet, and now in this digital age with our intellectual property, that it ought to be rooted in love and that it ought to be seen not as a sacrifice of you lacking or giving out of lack, but it is something unselfish, something that is born out of you not always asking, what is this or how is this going to benefit me? As we say that we live in a consumerist economy, we live in a, a consumerist uh, culture now that, that I won't engage with, with you unless I know what you can do for me or what I can do for you. And that even as we are still reeling and coming off the cusp of COVID, and understanding that when COVID, when the world shut down, that not everybody shut down that frontline workers that we were able, or that the government put labor over lives and, and to all of the doctors and nurses and medical professionals and all those who in this congregation served as frontline uh, workers, we commend you and, 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 and honor you because you went into the battleground and into the battlefield of that, of that time, amen? For all the doctors and nurses who adorn all the, the hazmat gear to go in and try to care for folks. It didn't matter how much their paycheck was going for. It, they, they understood that there was a need that needed to be fulfilled. And that even when the world stopped, there were people who were still going. And we understand that we live in a world that is toxic when it comes to labor, when it comes to the work that we do and, 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 and going and, and putting in overtime and not receiving just due and not receiving compensation for the work that we go above and beyond to do. But we understand that wrestling with the purity of labor, that we all have been gifted with something, but normally we lose that joy of our gift when it comes to making a living. That when we have parents who are pushing their children um, to go to college, to go into either medicine, law, or education, 
right? We don't want you to go into art. We don't understand what being a social organizer is. We don't understand what being a social artist is. Well, how are you going to make money? <laughs> I understand that you're gifted in this, that you've been called to this, but how are you going to get up out of my house when 21 come around? And we understand that there is this, like, this, this, there's this tension, right? That, that some of us who have been called into work that is not always lucrative when it comes to making a living. That if you're in one of those professions that, that parents, when they push you into law, into medicine, into education, we always hear the elders say, right, if you get into one of those career fields, you'll never be looking for a job. There'll always be opportunity for a job. But the wrestling that we are called to do versus what we are forced to do is even kind of biblical in a sense. That even in Genesis, Genesis chapter 3 verse 17, after the fall and after Eve had eaten of the fruit and Adam had eaten of the fruit and, and God was now conversing with Adam and, and God said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the truth of the tree from which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. In, in the King James Version says, by the sweat of your brow. In the sweat of your brow shall you eat till you return to the ground for out of you, which you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That even in the beginning, in the fall, there was this notion that God was saying, you're going to have to work now. That when we were in the Garden of Eden, when everything was peachy and smooth, and, I was, and God still provides, but now that by the sweat of your brow, what you want, you are going to have to work for. And then even in wisdom literature, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, it says, It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all of their labor in which they toil under the sun all the days of their lives which God gives them for it is their heritage. That your work, that what you build by your hands is your heritage, it is your legacy of not just what you are able to build but what you are able to pass on. Then even in the words of Jesus, Jesus answered in uh, John chapter 6, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your field. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you for on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And even our dear brother Paul in 1 Corinthians says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That we do not work just for temporary and temporal and for treasures just here on earth, but we are working for, uh, uh, to, to go to a place not built by man's hands. That we are working out our soul's salvation. And even when we think about labor in this sense, in the biblical sense, and we're thinking about vain, doing things in vain and vanity. Vanity is that inflated pride in oneself or in one's appearance, one would say conceited even. But another definition of vanity is that something is vain, something is empty or valueless. In a blog post called Dead Heroes Don't Save, uh, Mike uh, writes that this letter that James has written is in the context of, to, uh, is in the context of Jewish Christian immigrants that James is writing to folks who are already believers, but they have been exiled and they are now immigrants. They are living in a foreign land. And, and James writes to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, and he is saying to them that, that, that you still have an identity even though you are in a foreign land, that even if someone comes into your assembly who you do not know, that you are still to welcome them and to honor them. That this assembly is not just the church, but it is uh, the notion that we are building a community no matter where you come from or how you get here. That, that we are building a community and even as we are in this political uh, uh, discourse around immigrants and, and protecting our borders. That if you've ever been outcasted, if you ever had to go into a place, that the first place that you gain your identity is where you work. 
The first place you start to learn about how you uh, 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 are able to move and to be in the midst of people is normally at work. I know normally is at school, but normally when you start working on that nine to five and you, you're having to be accountable to other people or other people are starting to depend on you and if somebody else is slacking, it starts to look bad on you and you're like, hold on now. I got to figure out how to navigate myself without cussing somebody out. I can say that, right? I got to figure out how to navigate this without, without using some unknown tongues. I got to figure out how my labor still makes sense to me. Even in places where I feel like I don't belong. Even in places where I feel like I've been alienated. And perhaps that, that context of James writing to immigrants, to Christian immigrants, is how we feel in certain settings as black folks, as Trump has called it, in those black jobs. That when we have to continue to fight for the dignity of black and brown bodies in every space that we inhabit, especially in medicine, in education, in business, that we have to always be mindful of how our blackness speaks before we even say our name. And after us as a people, after we have been forced to come here and work in chattel slavery wrapped in a warped evangelical gospel to justify the cruelty and the evil of white supremacy forced to work from can't see in the morning to can't see in the evening with no compensation other than humiliation and degradation and generational trauma that we still fight through today. And then Dominic Coulter has the nerve to go around and say that black folks are lazy. But in the words of Paul Mooney, if you work for 400 years for free, you want to sit down somewhere too. <laughs> that we built this country. Saved this country time and time again. You've heard that it has been black movements that have saved and preserved the soul of this country. And I can even hear the words of David in Psalms 31, 37, after the, after the children of Israel had been exiled in antiquity. And, 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 and David writes that by the rivers of Babylon, by the rivers of America, I will even say there, we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, when we remembered Africa and our home. We, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. How, how what is the unmitigated God that you take a people away from their land and then demand them to sing a song. David said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And that's some of our plights this morning that wherever your labor has led you into to try to make a living, in the, especially in this expensive Bay Area, that we have to work two or three jobs just to make ends meet. That we have felt like exiles, we have felt uh, pushed out into the margins and forced to sing the Lord's song in strange lands, in strange places, in strange spaces. So James in this text is writing to not tell the tribes but to remind us, beloved, that our labor should not be in vain even under circumstances of where we feel like foreigners in spaces such as medicine and business and education where we have to relentlessly advocate for the health and wealth of black and brown bodies. But how do we make sure and ensure that our labor, our work, the gift that God has given us and that we are working toward does not go in vain, that it is not some vanity, that it is not to, to bolster up our pride, but, and, and, and it is also not, to us, not for us to give out of an empty space, but how do we make sure that our labor is purposeful, that we can take pride in what our hands and our feet are able to build? Well, I'm so glad you asked, and there's just three quick points, and the first one is that we must be accountable for our labor. Accountability accountability all the workers it says in the text in James he says all the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment the groans of the workers you use and abuse are in the uproar in the ears of God you've looted the earth you've looted the earth and that you're not building up any wealth you're building up judgment 
It is to be accountable for our labor and who we are answering to and, and the systems and the corporations that we find ourselves working in. The accountability, if I can break down the word God gave, God gave this to me, accountability, account for the ability. Give account for the ability. And I say that in the context of uh, when we think about our disabled loved ones, and I normally don't use that language of disabled or disabilities, I like to say differently able. That when we think about those who are differently able, that, that those who are able and have uh, the ability of our limbs, the ability to be quote unquote normal. That when we think about those, that, that ableism is the prejudice and discrimination aimed at differently able people, often with a patronizing desire to cure their disability and to make them normal rather than meeting them where they are listening to their story, understanding how medicine and science really does have validity, and understanding that we are not called to, to cast people out or to make people feel inferior or lesser than that. Just because you are able to do something does not mean you are able to do all things. And that we have to be mindful and give account for our ability in our gift of labor. Whatever God has gifted us to do, give account for the ability, I love that, that James used the word, the, the, the analogy of think about farmers who do this all the time, waiting for their valuable crops to mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Be patient like that. Stay steady and strong. Give account for the ability for God can arrive at any time. Our labor is the unselfish labor of love. It is the unselfish tilling of the soil in our lives and in the lives of others to, to make sure that we are planting seeds of love, of mercy and justice and not of judgment and, and, and condemnation and, and inferiority. That we are always making sure that we are speaking life. And when we give account for the ability is also the realization that we do not work to live, but we, that we don't live to work, that we work to live. You do not live to work. Work is not your identity. That nine to five or that 12 hour job is not who you are. I always love the admonishment that, that when you go and work for that job that you know you are using to get to the next step, that those, that those eight hours, 12 hours, that whatever is left, you need to be going back home and working on your own dream and, and your own plan. <laughs> that we do not live to work, but we work to live, to create the lives that we love. To take back our autonomy of time, that, that was really, I, I've been in this leadership training, we were talking about what is the vision that when we're asking people about their political stance, that folks don't want all that political jargon. I want to know how I, can, how I can drive up the street safely. I want to know that there are some good schools that are going to be a resource. I want to know that I can feel safe and secure. And that is the first step, that is giving the account for the ability to hold those who are in charge of those things accountable, but to also understand for us that giving account for our ability is to understand that we are in charge of our lives. We are, we, we, we are able to write the stories that we want. So it is to be accountable for your labor and for your gift. And then secondly, it is to be adaptable. You gotta be adaptable. James says, friends, don't complain about each other. For a father, uh, a far greater complaint can be lost against you, you know. You know? He says, what a gift, of, uh, what a gift life is to those who stay the course. And, and sometimes the course is not straight. There's some zigzagging, there's some zigzagging. There's some, some folks who you thought were on your side that you will realize weren't on your side. There are going to be some opportunities that you made it to the third round of the interview and, and yet you don't get that call back. There are going to be some times in life where you're going to have to learn how to adapt. To adapt and to be able to adapt to those who are not willing to adapt. That is really the, 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 the struggle right there. Being able to adapt to those who are not willing or not cognizant to adapt. If I can use this illustration, I, I, I you know, no, no harm or foul to those who have worked for the DMV. But I don't know if you ever journeyed to the DMV. But ain't too many folks that can adapt. 
at the DMV. But it builds patience. It builds uh, spiritual, <laughs> spiritual stability to hold one's tongue and to be able to navigate time, but to also understand that there is a call to be adaptable, to don't complain about each other. That if you are on the other side of that glass, you may be interacting the same way. But that there is the reality that in our labor and in our work, that there isn't always a straight line, that there are some things in life that will cause us to be deterred, that will cause us to question, God, did you really call me to do this? Sometimes God is asking us to make a pivot. It doesn't mean that you weren't called for it. It doesn't mean that I haven't gifted you for it, but in this season, in this moment, that you have to be willing and open to make a pivot, to make a change, and to realize not just pivoting or making a change, but, but sometimes the change is to reveal what has been in front of you the whole time. Sometimes we miss those things that are right in front of our nose, this illustration says that there was a lady who lived in a home without running water. She lived in a home without running water for two and a half years. And she had to drive to a spring and load up five gallon jugs to haul back home. All the while, there was a perfectly good well with a 600 gallon reservoir on her property. See, some of y'all don't know about that well water. Anybody know about well water? Have mercy, them my southern folks. When you've been playing in, in 98 degree weather all day in humidity and, and somebody got that water hose and you get that good well water. But all the while she had a well on her property and she had been driving to, driving to and fro to this spring to get water and the water was there the whole time but she did not see how it could be used. Adaptability is often for our own good. It is to reveal the wells in our lives that we forgot were there or we didn't even look to see that were there. So in our labor, for it not to be in vain, we must be accountable, account for the ability of our labor and then also to be adaptable and then lastly and most importantly is that we must be authentic. We must always be authentic. Verse 12, James writes, and since you know that God cares, that God cares down to the very last detail. Let your language show it. Don't add words like, I swear to God, or uh, don't show your impatience by concocting oaths to hurry up God. Just let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Just say what is true. That way your language cannot be used against you. Your labor, your gift, of time, talent, or treasure. How you show up, not just at Imani, but in your workplace, in your family, in your friendships, is all about authenticity. If you think about all of your friendships that have lasted and those who you really rock with and who you know really rock with you, and those relationships, even between mentors and mentees, that normally those are relationships that just happen. Because you realize that that person is authentic without them even having to say it. You realize that that person is genuine. That your labor is a manifestation of your word. Your labor is a manifestation of who you are and who you say you are. That your word is born, as they say on the street. Your word is born. If you ain't got nothing else to stand on, if you can't stand on your word. that your labor is a manifestation of your word and to be authentic is to know that you have been stamped with something, especially as a Christian, as a believer of God and a person of faith, you have been stamped with the stamp of authenticity. When I got, I went to um, a fundraiser event for um, uh, the EO, uh, EOIDC, East Oakland Youth Development Center. And as I say that, I'll make a quick pivot uh, to say that uh, in the hustle and bustle of life and how things God just orchestrates without you knowing. Um, and those who do not know, I've introduced her before, but a lot of people may not know that my partner and my lady in life, Sister Anaya Cleveland, ah, and that I might want to say, <laughs> has officially, she was, uh, we're both from Georgia, had met in Georgia. 
um, has officially moved out here and has started a full-time job at EOYDC. Amen. Amen. So just a little plug. Just a little plug. Um, but we're just grateful uh, for God, how God has been working. Um, so when I went to this fundraiser event at EOYDC a few years back and uh, they were doing a raffle and um, I was able to win uh, a signed basketball by Clay Thompson. Right. Ain't that right? Who now left us, so I know it's, it's going to be worth some money now, so I'm going to hold on to but he'll be, I, feel, I feel like he'll be back. We'll retire him as a warrior. We'll retire him as a warrior. Um, but I had the ball, you know, signed. And, and if you've been at a raffle, and you know, I, at first when I got the box, Reverend Rob, all I saw was the basketball. And I saw the signature. But of course, you think in your mind, right? Anybody could have signed this. But as I kept looking through the box, I saw a little slip of paper that said, Stamp of Authenticity. And every now and again, you ought to remind yourself that you've been bought with the price, that you have a stamp of authenticity. That people may say, I don't know how you do that, that, oh, you didn't do that out of the goodness of your heart. No, I didn't. I did because Jesus told me to. <laughs> that I've been bought with the price, I have been stamped with the stamp of authenticity. I just came to remind you that you've been bought with the price. Paul declares, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were stamped with the stamp of authenticity. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, honor God with your labor, honor God with everything that you do. And in the words of Dr. King, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody that they are traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a good man or if I can bring back beauty to a world of wrought, if I can spread love's message as the master taught, then my living shall not be in vain. For it was me, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply sane within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters, he lifted me. Now safe am I. What was it? It was love that lifted me. It was God's unselfish labor of love that lifted me. Is anybody grateful that love lifted you out of the pits of everything that the world tried to throw at you? That it was God's love that lifted you. Amen. It was love. It was grace. It was mercy. Even when I didn't deserve it, I didn't dot every I. I didn't cross every T. But by, but by the Lord, the love of God saw fit to rescue me, to rescue you. And because of that loving God, because we give account for the ability, because we're able to acknowledge our gift and the work that we do, and we remain authentic, our labor and our living will not be in vain. Amen. Amen. Amen.